Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 76, and we're going to cover Joshua chapters 14 through 16. Last time we left off, we made the point that in chapters 13 through 21, it's going to become pretty redundant because Israel is going to be conquering the land that God had already prophesied and ordained for them. And now they're just executing and conquering this land during the conquest. And so far, we talked about a few things. One thing we talked about is you have to think about the land on each side of the River Jordan. Remember, they were coming in from the east. And so when they got to that territory right by the Jordan, remember Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay on the east side of the Jordan. They said, hey, we'll go in and fight with you, but this land is beautiful. We would like to stay here. And so you have two and a half tribes on one half of the Jordan, and then you have nine and a half on the other side. And we're about to look at some of those. Like today, we'll look at Judah and we'll start off with Caleb in chapter 14. And I really want to swoop down and grab something here for you guys, because this is very encouraging just to see what happens here with Caleb. So verse one says, now these are the territories which the sons of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel apportioned to them for an inheritance by the lot of their inheritance as the Lord commanded through Moses for nine and a half tribes. Remember, we just talked about that. Verse three, for Moses had given an inheritance of two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan. And we have to always remember this in verse three, but he did not give an inheritance to the Levites among them. And remember, the Levites don't get a portion because the Lord is to be their portion and they're to facilitate the Levitical system and the people are to take care of them. But listen to this in verse six about Joshua. It says, then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenizzite said to him, you have the word which the Lord spoke to you, Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear, but I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore to that day, saying, Surely the land which your feet has trodden will be an inheritance to you and your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years from the time that Moses spoke the words when Israel walked in the wilderness. And and behold, I am now 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses, in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Listen to this in verse 13. It says, so Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephna, for an inheritance. So think about what's happening here. Okay, remember Caleb was one of the spies with Joshua when they went into the land. It was 12 spies and two came back with a good report, Caleb being one of them. And he was sent out, he's recounting it. He was sent out from Kadesh Barnea. And when he went over, He brought back a good report. The text says that he followed the Lord fully. And he said, I said what was in my heart. And this happened when he was 40 years old. And he says, now it's 45 years from now. And my very feet, listen to this. My very feet are on the land which I spied and came in and saw the report that I gave. Other people said that we were grasshoppers in their sight. But I said that we could conquer this land because the Lord has given it to us. And so Caleb is saying, I just want to have the land where my feet, when I saw a good report, I was a spy and I came back and reported it back to Moses. And Caleb's a man's man. Can you think about that? That's the language of a leader. That's the language of a conqueror. He's saying, my feet are standing on the land, which I by faith trusted in the Lord. God, can I please have that land that I can always remember you and that I always trust you and I never gave up on you? And it says in the text that Moses promised that he can have that land. And right now, Caleb is getting that land. Can you think about the victory in that? Think about the vindication, the joy, the excitement, 
knowing that when everybody was saying no, you said yes. Where everybody was hopeless and cast in doubt, you were hopeful and you were casting faith and vision and trusting in the Lord. And it checked out. The Lord was on your side and he fought for you and he's giving you what you promised. Not only the land, he's giving you the land that your feet were on 45 years ago when you spied this land, seeing if you all could go in. Man, this moment of vindication, this moment of reflection is just so powerful. And I can't help but to worship with Caleb because I know this probably reduced him to tears just being in this city and being able to take this land. And so quite naturally, we move from there to chapter 15, where it talks about the territory of Judah. And so they're going to break the tribes down. Now we're on the west side of the Jordan, and we're going to talk about Judah, which they start central. Remember, they move southern, they conquer southern. This is where Judah is. And so what these chapters are going to do is basically like a title deed. It's going to mark the boundaries and territories of these lands. So look at verse one. Now the lot of the tribe of the sons of Judah, according to their families, reached the border of Edom southward to the wilderness of Zan, to the extreme south. The south border was from the lower end of the salt sea, from the bay that turns to the south. You see that? And in verse six, it says, then the border went up to Beth Hagla. In verse 15, it says, now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephna, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua. And Caleb drives out everybody in that land. He conquers that land and he gets it. In fact, he says in verse 16, whoever attacks and conquers that land, I will give him my daughter. And so Othniel does this. The brother of Caleb captures it. And so Caleb gives Aksha, his daughter, as a wife to him. Now we're going to read more about Othniel in Judges chapter 3. He's going to come up again. And he's a conqueror just like Caleb. And Caleb is now become his father-in-law, and Othniel is going to be one of the judges that we'll cover in Israel. So mark that name or remember that name when we bring it up again. And the rest of chapter 15 talks about the borders and the boundaries that Judah takes. And it ends here in verse 63. I think this is a good verse to bring to light. It says, now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. This is very critical because remember, Jerusalem is the city that Jesus dies in. And so Jerusalem is going to be a very important city. So they're going to have to get Jerusalem. But there's a note here that says they don't get it at this time. But David is going to get it. But notice the theology that's being built around Jerusalem. The first time we hear about it is remember Melchizedek was a king of Salem, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a very important place. We know that the king Melchizedek was there and he taught Abraham theology at that time. So that's significant because Hebrews is going to pick back up on that. But that city gets established as a place where kings are. And David is going to conquer this area and take control of it again. And when I tell you that Jesus was the captain of the army, he's the true conqueror because he doesn't start in Jerusalem. He moves to Jerusalem at the end of his journey because he's tying into Joshua as well as the law and the prophets showing that he, just like Joshua, he's a conqueror. He's coming to Jerusalem to conquer it, but he'll conquer it through death. He'll die for his people and bring salvation to mankind, but then he'll come back again to reign there. And we wrap up today with the tribe of Ephraim. So Ephraim gets the territory, says here in verse one, that the lot of the sons of Joseph, remember, Joseph gets a double portion, Ephraim and Manasseh. But we'll talk about Manasseh because remember, half of the tribe stayed on the east side of the Jordan. And we'll talk about the other half tomorrow. But Ephraim today, it says that the lot of the sons of Joseph went from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho on the east into the wilderness, going up from Jericho through the hill country of Bethel. But we get a very concerning statement at the end of this chapter, verse 10, it says, but they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived at Gezer. So the Canaanites live in the midst of Ephraim to this day, and they became forced laborers. And you should say, oh man, there it is. They're going to feel this conquest. People aren't getting driven fully out. The Gibeonites deceived them. People are staying on the east side of the Jordan. They're not coming all the way in the land. You're getting hint after hint. 
as amazing as this second generation is, they're flawed and they won't succeed. They're going to fail us. In fact, it's going to get so bad. Our very next book is Judges. And this is one of the worst times in the nation of Israel. This is about as bad as they get. And we'll be there soon before you know it, covering it. But let's continue to faithfully walk through Joshua and see this conquest. But let's always remember that even though they may fail this conquest, the one who is coming behind him will not fail. You can call him the cleanup crew because he cleans up this mess and he does it. And we can rest our salvation on him because he is a solid rock. He is a sure foundation. Therefore, we become to know all of the ground as seeking sand. And we need to stand on this solid rock boldly all the days of our lives. You guys take care. Talk to you next time.